What's going on everyone? Today I want to address the telltale question, the one that's always coming up, the super simple question that I quite honestly haven't fully addressed. And that is, what is ketosis and what creates a ketone body? And ultimately, how do we measure them? So I'm here with Joe Anderson, who is an amazing, amazing person who has published a lot of articles in the world of pulmonary research. And I wanted to introduce him because he is a expert in the world of ketosis. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as you said, I have a background in, in chemical engineering, but a lot of research in pulmonary physiology, pulmonary medicine. Uh, my research has really been on how do chemicals move from the body into the exhaled breath, and then how do we measure those chemicals? And I've uh, been doing that for, for quite a while. Uh, published quite a few, about 40 peer-reviewed scientific studies. and. Um, Recently have been working with a company to understand how to measure those chemicals in the body using uh, breath. Awesome. So, well, I wanted to be able to have an opportunity to talk to you about ketones and how they're truly created in the body, because I think for the most part, we understand the embryonic level of ketosis. Like we understand that, okay, we're not consuming carbohydrates or our bodies are utilizing fats as a source of fuel. Sure, we get that. But what is actually happening in the body? What is happening when we deprive ourselves of carbohydrates and, and what's happening to encourage our bodies to utilize fats, and how are those fats used as energy? Right, so obviously kind of a complex question there, but the idea is that when, you're, when your body is deprived of, of glucose, uh, which your body loves to use, when it's not present, then the body basically lowers the amount of insulin. Insulin's really the signal. And insulin kind of opens up the gates for fats to flood in from your stored body fats. The other way is if you eat fats. So, Either way, once they get into the bloodstream, these fats circulate throughout the body. Uh, when the fats get to the liver, they get converted into energy, but some of those fats also get moved into this idea of ketone bodies. So the fats can be either used for energy production or they can be used for ketone bodies. And kind of as a side note, you may say, well, why would you use some of these for ketone bodies? That seems foolish. Why don't you just use it all for energy? Yeah. It's the most efficient. Well, our, our bodies have been designed or they've been created to use these, use these ketone bodies for brain fuel. And the reason that is, is your brain cannot use fats for energy. You can use glucose, you can use sugar, can't use fats. So if you're in a starvation mode or you're in a lack of uh, finding food, then your, your brain would die. So that's why these ketone bodies are created. They're created in the liver, uh, and the mother ketone body is this one called acetoacetate. So remember, they're created when low, low supply of sugar, insulin is decreased, fats are prevalent. The mother is acetoacetate, and that mother molecule can make two other ones. One is beta-hydroxybutyrate, which kind of interconverts between acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Acetoacetate also produces acetone, which is, uh, once it's produced, it goes off by itself. It doesn't interconvert back. Gotcha, so acetone essentially is a keto that ultimately is just a byproduct. Exactly. Gotcha. Right. So, and when you say the body or the brain can only use ketones, like I've, I've often referred to it as, take the word ketones and think of the word key. The brain needs that key to actually have energy. So that's why ketones essentially end up being a source of energy for the brain. They are the only ones that have the key to get into the brain outside of glucose. Correct. Now, another thing that I've looked at before, and maybe you can kind of attest to this, I mean, by and large, what separates us from other animals is the fact that we have a very powerful brain and it's our probably our most key component when it comes down to survival. We have a brain that allows us to have relatively good cognitive function that can keep us alive. It can allow us to brainstorm and figure out how to survive, you know. So are ketones sort of a survival mechanism in that sense to keep the brain alive if all else starts to fail? That's exactly it because back, you know, years ago, thousands of years ago, we didn't have a constant source of food. So you may go kill an animal, eat, but then you may not eat for weeks before you find your next, your next, your next meal. So your, your sugar levels or your glucose levels drop and then you're using stored body fat. So if your brain doesn't have any energy because it can't use fats, you gotta have something else there. So the body is able to use those fats, convert them into a different chemical ketone bodies that it can then use for brain energy and all sort of neuro neurological energy that includes your spine and your other uh, nervous system components. Really interesting. Yeah. Okay, so and I know a lot of the people that are watching my channel typically want to know a little bit more 
about the science of that conversion process. Do you mind just explaining just a little bit about how acetoacetate actually starts to convert into acetone and converts into beta-hydroxybutyrate? Right, and that, that's, yeah, obviously a little more biochemical. So acetoacetate, there's actually an enzyme or kind of machinery that converts acetoacetate into beta-hydroxybutyrate. Mm -hmm. And that enzyme can also convert beta-hydroxybutyrate back to acetoacetate, and that's important. And the idea is beta-hydroxybutyrate's really there as a storage molecule. Think of, you know, you go and, once again, going back to this killing animals, that's not what we're really here for. But it, let's say you, you, have an, you have a large amount of food, it can be beef or whatever, you're going to take some of that and store it in your freezer. Uh, so beta-hydroxybutyrate really is the way to store that molecule in a different place. Now, once the acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate go from the liver, get in the bloodstream, then get out to maybe your skeletal muscle or get to your brain, <clears throat> the beta-hydroxybutyrate gets converted back to acetoacetate to actually be used for energy. So that backward shift, once again, that enzyme uh, converts beta-hydroxybutyrate back to acetoacetate to be used in those what we'd call peripheral tissues, your, your skeletal muscle, Interesting. your brain, et cetera. The other side of things, the acetoacetate gets converted into acetone is the other side, right? But the one the great thing about acetone is you can measure it in the exhaled breath. It's very small, so it, what we, you could call it evaporates, but it's volatile, mm -hmm. so it can appear in the breath, and then you can measure it in the exhaled. Which kind of segues into what I really want to talk about next, which is how do you measure ketones? And I know there's a couple of different ways to do it. And I want to lead off by talking about the urine strips because they drive me crazy and I want to talk about the one thing that really has driven me crazy about them the most and that's the fact that maybe you guys have noticed this before. When you use a ketone urine strip, if you're in ketosis, you may find that throughout the first week or so of keto, it works really, really well. Like you, you notice you're registering on the keto strip, you're going dark purple, you're showing high amounts of ketones, you're excited and then two, three weeks into it, suddenly you're not registering those ketones anymore because your body's getting adapted and you're not having these excess ketones that are showing up in the urine. But um, I mean, can you explain a little bit more about how maybe the, the urine strips and even the blood meters work? Sure, so the, the urine strips, uh, that would be the one I'd be negative on, I guess. I, I try not to be too negative, but the urine strips are problematic because uh, number one, it's measuring acetoacetate, which is great. Uh, it can, some of them can measure also acetone as well because of the reaction they use on that strip. But remember, the acetoacetate and the acetone have to get into the urine, so they have to pass through your kidneys. So a couple things are happening there. If you're not well hydrated, the, you, may not, you may get differing concentrations of these in your urine. If you have kidney dysfunction, so you have a kidney disorder, you're going to have a differential con concentration. Probably the biggest thing that's a problem with it is remember, you make a measurement you don't urinate all the time, right? Yeah. You've got to feel like you've got to go. So, and that sounds funny, but you've got to build up enough urine to actually urinate. So you're really, it's an integrated concentration. So it's not, I have a high concentration now, but then a lower concentration and a lower concentration, you integrate that together, it can be different than what you are at currently. So it's kind of not, it's kind of a, uh, like I said, an average. It's not really a indication of where you're at right at the moment. Gotcha. And then the other, the other way that people measure a lot is with, with blood meters, which... Well, yeah, let me go back to the other thing with urine, like you said, is it's not really quantitative, Yeah. right? So you get a different color, you don't really have a value, um, it's hard to track and trend, and it's, it's also very private, right? You're not, you're not going to be doing this out in, in uh, public, I, so to speak. I don't be everywhere. <laughs> well, if, yeah, if you live in my neighborhood, some people do that, but... <laughs> But in polite society, we like to try to do that behind closed doors, right? Yeah, no, definitely. And well, it's like you said, it's when, when it comes down to really measuring your success, I'm always a big fan of eliminating variables whenever possible. You know, it's, and when it comes down to something like ketosis, it doesn't matter how early on in learning keto you are or how experienced you are. I think one of the reasons that people like it is because it is so black and white and is so measurable. And when you get down to something like uh, the urine strips, it really adds way too many variables into the equation. I mean, the thing that's nice about ketosis in the first place is you're eliminating the variable of carbohydrates, right? It's pretty darn simple, fats and proteins. And when you eliminate that variable, it's easy to stick to, which is why it's so easy for people. So why complicate it by adding a measurement that includes variables? So which... Which, which why when you move to blood ketones <clears throat> are such a better, better option, right? Because you're sticking your finger, you're taking a blood drop that's pretty well controlled because it's just coming straight from your your, uh, your circulatory system, and then you're putting on a strip. And so you have a pretty good sample that's um, being analyzed by the device as well as it's a quantitative measure. So you get a you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 millimolar concentration. So those are all nice things. Now, 
probably the, the things that are difficult about the blood meter is just you have to prick your finger, which at first glance, I think we all think, ah, oh, it's just you pricking your finger. But when you start to do it day after day, it starts to become a little more painful, yeah. and sometimes you get some bruising. Um, and then the other, the other thing that's probably uh, not great is the cost. Yeah. So, which is a few bucks. It used to be four or five dollars. I think now it's two to three dollars now. Um, but if you mess up sampling on one of those, which can happen, then you uh, then you got to use. There goes your Starbucks for the day. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But th but there are some nice things. It is the gold standard at the moment, right? Yeah. It is the way people really understand. Uh, ketosis. I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about the third way to measure, which is through your breath, and really how that can be done and why it's advantageous and why it's uh, superior to some of the other levels, but also how it pertains not just to ketosis, but to anyone who's really trying to measure whether they're in a fat burning state or not. And this is where I just totally geek out on this stuff. So I'll kind of turn it to you to describe you know, the third way with the breath. One of the things we really like about measuring a chemical in breath is it's very simple, mm -hmm. right? You don't have the invasiveness of, of a finger prick. You don't have the privacy issue around urine. You can do it with other folks, and you can make multiple measurements, right? So if you mess up one, <laughs> it's just the next breath down the road is your next sample. Um, so one of the things that we've done, one of the things that we've tried to implement is to make this a comfortable measurement and to make it a repeatable measurement. Yeah. Kind of the things we talked about with the sampling. Um, and also, like we said, acetone is small, so it appears in your exhaled breath. So it's something that we can measure in the breath as opposed to having to kind of interrogate the body to get that chemical out. Gotcha, yeah, and, and with level, it gives you a quick and easy way to basically see where your breath acetone levels are at. So a quick and easy gauge of where am I in the spectrum of fatty acid utilization, burning fat, oxidizing fat, and you can really start to develop these trends, like when am I burning fat? When am I not burning fat? And the reason I want to bring this back just to fat burning in general and not just ketosis is simply because when you are burning fat, whether you are ultimately in ketosis or not, you are producing acetone. And that is your indicator of burning fat. And a keto strip can't tell you that. And a blood meter really is pretty hard to tell with. So it's nice to be able to test immediately, even if you're not in keto, be like, I just exercised, it's X time a day. I want to see if I am in an optimal state of fat burning right now. I mean, it really allows us to, no pun intended, level up like where you are in terms of how you monitor yourself. I'm not in ketosis right now. Uh, this is still going to measure where my breath acetone is regardless, right? It's, that's correct, yes. Interesting. Because breath acetone is related to, to fat metabolism, fat loss. There's a nice study that was done back in the early 90s that showed if you can elevate your breath acetone above two parts per million, you can expect to lose about a half pound of fat mass per week if you're on a calorie-restricted diet. So a little bit different the folks out there who are a ketogenic diet, yeah. but if you're calorie restricted just on your standard American diet, um, you can lose about a uh, half pound of fat mass if you're at a two or higher. And then as you continue to increase your breath acid and hold it there for a week, you can increase the fat loss. And that's what this kind of study showed. So one of the things to think about with, with breath acetone is the measurement is gonna be different than blood. Most people have about one part per million of acetone on their breath, just your guy off the street, so to speak. Um, two and higher is elevated fat metabolism. And one of the things that's nice that we've been seeing that we're gonna validate here shortly is if you're at eight parts per million or greater, you should be in that nutritional ketosis, which is about a half millimolar of beta hydroxybutyrate in the blood. For the folks who, are, who really kind of get this stuff, you're, 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 you understand that. I always say, even if you're in ketosis, the whole idea is you're getting yourself adapted to fats so that when you are in a calorie deficit, the first thing that your body wants to utilize is fat, not glucose that it would preferentially normally want to run on, right? So if you can get yourself to an eight and you're in the nutritional state of ketosis, then once you're in a calorie deficit, you are in action. Right, and you can, your body can probably more readily pull fat from the body stores, exactly. as opposed to say, oh, I've got to go search for, for glucose, and it may be a tough search, right? Exactly. You may have to break down some of your uh, structural structural components to get that cool. glucose. Well, uh, thank you, Joe. And for everyone that's curious about this, I put a link down below in the description so you guys can check out Level and see if uh, you want to start taking your ketosis to the next level, no pun intended again, and, uh, and start checking when you're in keto, when you're not in keto, and when you're burning the most fat. So as always, keep it locked in here on the channel. And thanks, Joe. Yeah, you got it.